I sent some images, uh, sorry, some images, some texts around to some people today, as I talked about earlier. One of the people I sent a text to, to say, you know, uh, officially on the record, what will you be doing tomorrow was uh, Dr. Anna Brooks. And uh, I can only say that I got a fiery response from Dr. Anna Brooks. So I think that I said to her, Anna, why don't you come on and talk about it? Hi there. How, how are you? Welcome. Me? Fiery? <laughs> well, I looked at it and I won't say what you said because we want to talk about it. But um, yeah. Uh, a fairly, a fairly, a fairly firm response. So before I ask you that question, and I've actually got responses from Susie Wiles and David Welsh as well, which we can have a look at what they said they'd be doing tomorrow at the supermarket, so to speak. Um, tell us about the uh, decision today. Where are you sitting on it? What are your thoughts? Um, complete disregard for the vulnerable is where I'm sitting. Um, you know, we, we all sort of knew that this situation would come, you know, that, that restrictions would drop. But it's one thing to, you know, to expect restrictions to drop, but it's another thing entirely for there be to be no systems in place to protect the vulnerable, like none. So there's, you know, there's been no advancement in, um, in making sure that our air spaces are well ventilated. Uh, basically, people have, vulnerable people have been dodging, uh, you know, public places to date, and now they're really locked up. Mm -hmm. Now they have zero choice. They can't even go to a supermarket safely. Um, so it's it's really distressing in the vulnerable communities. So no, like, I guess that, that the most frustrating part of all this is it's this it's this big focus on death again. Yes, case numbers are coming down, and that's that's great. And so is you know the mortality, but there's complete disregard and like no discussion about long COVID, about the impacts of getting infected. So the other things that I find uh, very frustrating about today is, uh, you know, you were just discussing booster shots. What about mm. those of us under 50 who would like to be protected right now because our immunity is waning? Um, that, should that not have been something that was widely accessible before, you know, we throw our, away our masks and, you know, be completely vulnerable? This virus finds the vectors it needs. And there's no denying that. So, you know, when, when we hear about the wall of immunity and on and all these, you know, catchphrases about why reasons are, the cases are coming down. Yes, that's happening, but we've still got cases. The cases are infecting people who mm -hmm. have not been infected. Like, yeah. that is what's happening. And, you know, and, and the great thing is, is yes, the, the boosters do add that layer of protection. You, you hear about it anecdotally. You hear about it anecdotally. The pockets that are happening right now are people who have not been infected before, and it's getting them. And the people who aren't getting the infections, are, you know, they may have already had it and they might be boosted. There is a layer of protection there. So if you take away all of these protections, I mean, you know, getting on a plane with everyone surrounded you without a mask on, on a bus, you know, all of these things now, your, your layer of protection is, has vanished. Um, so... Yeah, so I think it's tough. I, I, I think, you know, it was a complete disregard. And and hearing words like, now that we're going to have um, clarity, clarity, clarity for the vulnerable that they've been forgotten. Um, I also wondered, and I don't know if you know the answer to this exactly, but when the Prime Minister says, you know, in consultation with health officials, we've made this decision, who are they speaking to? Good question. No one in the uh, vulnerable communities um, got a look in. Um, you know, there's, there's, as I say, there's, there's been no discussions about, you know, those impacted by long COVID. And what we're seeing um, come out, uh, you know, through the research is that people with long COVID are more likely to get reinfected, you know, like as in we're sort of seeing okay. that happening. I mean, okay, it's a little bit anecdotal at, at this point, um, but you know that the studies coming out and and the and the children especially were sort of showing that you know you you may have got you know uh, gone through a recovery phase with your long COVID and then a reinfection happens and boom everything comes screaming back again. It's just one of those things that's just not getting spoken about. You know the vulnerabilities of repeat infections. Um, how could w they have they been the government made the decision? Mm -hmm. How could this have happened? without that concern i guess what i'm saying is uh, i'm not saying this like it's so it makes it okay but isn't there a reality that the vulnerable are always going to be vulnerable and if there's a chance of catching it that's always going to be 
a situation like how, how would if you were advising the pm what would you have said about what will you would you need to see to go to this let's get rid of the traffic lights well yeah and it is like a lot of the experts are saying we we need a new normal we know we don't need to go back to 2019 we need to normalize safe air airspace we we need you know every event we host or hold where we're in confined spaces if it's ventilated it's going to be safer all of mm. those um those layers of protection we haven't seen change so it, you're, you're right you know like as in vulnerable people will continue to be vulnerable but i think there has been no noises or or sort of strong messaging to actually make change within our businesses or our workplaces or whatever. So, you know, so we're facing, you know, as soon as the announcement came, I'm a university lecturer, you know, the, the ripples started coming through, you know, what do we feel about going back to lecturing with no masks? And, you know, just we've, we've just come out of mid semester break and uh, the week before two COVID cases in my class. And, you know, and I felt safe because we were all masking. Yeah, right. What happens next? We all get infected if we're vulnerable and yeah. that's the thing the different demographics that are in classrooms or you know if you haven't had it and this is the thing if you have not had COVID you know it's going to it it finds the vulnerable person or the person that can infect doesn't it that that's just how these waves happen so so those are the things that are alarming to us is that everyone has the right to education everyone has the right to a safe workplace what have we done to protect those rights and the answer seems very little, like that nothing's changed. Yeah, I've learned quite a bit about um, like carbon dioxide parts per million in the last few weeks. I've had, I've got, there's this community group in Dunedin who did some work in my house. And one of the things they've asked is from doing the work in the house, can they install this? It's it's basically a sensor for them to yeah. get data on the houses they're doing work in. I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, of course you can. And I've got a link for it. And so I can go and have a look at it and I can have a look at things like the moisture in the house. And one of the things is parts per million of carbon dioxide. And I mean, again, you're the, you're the expert here, but my understanding is outside is about 300 to 400 parts per million of CO2 in the, in the outside here. And if you're inside and it gets above 800, that's time to open up the doors and kind of air the place out. Watching, watching the graph of my house, um, you know, around 9.30, 10, 10.30 at night, when everyone's going to bed, it spikes up over 800. During the day when I'm home by myself working, it's down around 300. So when you when when I've got that visual representation now, I understand it a bit more about yeah. if the 800 parts per million uh, and you know is the is the kind of danger time for the virus to be spread around. How easy it is to get there. I've heard other stories of people at workplaces who will carry around their own little kind of portable CO2 monitors and they mm -hmm. put them on the middle of the desks while they're talking. And if it goes up to like six, seven hundred, that, that's when they open up the windows. They let it go yeah. down and they close the windows and they keep talking. Is that a realistic kind of expectation? Is that where we actually need to go in society uh, as in a way? not Because I also think, you know, cough, colds and flus, that would help just with that as well. But is that what? sort of what we need to move towards? Of course. You know, we need to normalise that it's a great thing to breathe in safe air. And that's what we've been sort of trying to push the message on, you know, since, you know, since we sort of said that vaccines aren't enough. Mm. Um, because, of course, we, we also weren't sort of saying that, you know, we should mask forever more either. No one wants that, you know, but a mask should be your added layer of protection if you're not safe in the airspace that you're in. So if we start with the air around us and start monitoring that and making that safe, then yes, of course, requirements for masking is going to plummet. And as you say, you know, if your air is clean, it, it's good for education. It's good, mm. you know, for your brain to, to have clean air. It's good for schools, all of those things. So that's what we were sort of hoping that, you know, that society would sort of change and there'd be pressures for our airspace, just like we don't drink dirty water. So those are the things that a lot of the experts are actually calling for was, was better ventilation so that, you know, we would stop getting uh, respiratory viruses in general. And so, a, 
It's such a hard thing to put in place, though, because it's it's retrospective, isn't it? It's like trying to build infrastructure within a city that already exists. Like, how do you fix Auckland's transport problems? That's you already have the restrictions. How do you do the ventilation? You know, in the middle of winter here in Dunedin, when it's literally literally last week snowing outside, it sort of feels like it needs to be some kind of system within the building. But then that's an installation of something. That's a cost. It sounds like. Like if you are building a new house, it seems like this is one of the new things that you should put on your tick list. You know, yeah. how do you work with ventilation? But if you're living in a, like me, a 1960 house, it'd be, we do have a, an HRV system, but that that's only a, an aspect of it. Actual proper ventilation for this situation is a is something to try and think. How can we? How is it a practical application? I guess I'm saying. Yeah, absolutely. But you know, this is this isn't a you know a one time event. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, today it sounded like, woo, COVID's over. And, you know, the totally. virus, the virus wasn't consulted. You know, the, the <laughs> virus, you know, the virus didn't decide that today's the day it's going to just shuffle off. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, it's like we, we've just, as a nation, have decided it's, it's time to, you know, let it rip round who hasn't had it yet. And, and so, and, and, and the thing is, is we know that more variants are likely, more waves are likely, all of those things are likely. And so the more that we prepare, you know, now's the time to prepare, you know, preparing for something you do it yesterday. So, yeah. you know, preparing, preparing for the future that this is respiratory viruses are here to stay. And, and the, the more that we can prevent them and prevent illness, the better. And despite, you know, the more that we ignore this pandemic, Again, the virus doesn't care. And, you know, it, it's going to, you know, it's going to get people on their second or third infection and that's going to put them in bed and that's going to give them their long COVID or their heart problem or their neurological condition. You know, like just ignoring that that this virus causes long-term impacts doesn't make it go away. Um, it just makes those long-term impacts even harder to educate on because nobody thinks that they exist and nobody wants to listen. Um, my health, my health hobs, my health hobs has just kind of also put out sort of what you're talking about, the vulnerable. My health hobs says I live with two immunocompromised people, immunocompromised people. Uh, for me, lockdown starts now gutted. Yeah. I guess that's kind of speaking to what you're talking about. Exactly. And this is, you know, this is what we've been um, advocating for for such a long time now. It, it, nobody lives in, in an environment it, in a site you know in their own little bubble we've got children at schools yeah. you know there'll be families impacted everywhere where they don't feel that, that it's safe for their children to go to school now because it might not be the child it could be the parent the grandparent whoever's living in that household that's vulnerable so we've now just been all everyone who's anyone who is vulnerable and whether that's vulnerable clinically or immunocompromised immunosuppressed or not vaccinated. We, we can't forget that under fives aren't vaccinated. Uh, you know, some of our youth aren't boosted. And as we just spoke about, under 50s still don't have access to the fourth boost. I would have liked to have seen all of those things, you know, like as in tick as many boxes or as, as protected as you can be before yep. all of these protections stopped. I would have liked a fourth boost. And, and I think you were talking about this before. If you look up online, we're not eligible. But there's yeah. a few rumours going around that, um, you know, I, I'm pretty certain I was offered it um, a few weeks ago. And I was like, well, I'm not eligible yet. Well, well so, like out the, back of a, out the back of a station wagon or something. Hey, 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 yeah, got, a, got a vaccine? Want a vaccine? <laughs> <laughs> it was actually in a pharmacy. Okay. <laughs> so, so there was a, a slight, I'm, I'm pretty certain the pharmacist said, oh, in, you know, I can give it to you now if, if you want. But, and I was like, oh, I'm not eligible. So, um, so those did you, sorts of. Did you take, were you insulted? Did, were they saying you look over 50? Is that what <laughs> I was saying? Yeah, exactly. What are you saying? <laughs> I was like, what? Yeah, so I, I was not eligible. And so, so that was that. But, you know, like, because there's loads of people that are vulnerable that yeah. would absolutely take up a fourth boost if it gave mm -hmm. them that layer of protection. And so, it, and is there mixed messages out there? Is it accessible if you went and asked for it? I don't really know. I'm just pretty certain that I was offered it um, because I look 50, you know, clearly. 
<laughs> hey, Anna, Wait. you know you, you know this question is the question I sent you, and, and I'm asking several people today, and I'm, shortly I'll show you Dr. David Welsh's and Susie Wiles's answer where they texted back to me. Um, but so today, right, you're at the supermarket today under the current regulations, must wear a mask, et cetera. You go to the supermarket tomorrow, Anna, are you changing any of your habits? Are you changing any of your practice? No, masking all the way. Like, I mean, and the one thing that I just will find completely frightening is public transport, like getting on an aeroplane. Like, I, I just saw a, a, a messaging just before about, you know, the fact that, you know, planes are saying, oh, you know, or, you know, our airlines are saying, yay, no more masking. It's like, is that going to, the next one going to be, yay, no more staff. They're all sick with COVID. You <laughs> yeah, know, no like, more flights. No more flights. Oh, we're going to cancel all your holidays because there's no staff. So that's, and, and that's the thing. That's what masking does. It keeps people in business. And yeah, so, of true. course, yes, the cases are coming down, um, but that's just because, you know, we had safety precautions. If a whole plane is now all bets are off, you know, th there might be a staff member on every plane that is exposed daily. So, so no, I, I, masking needs to be there. We, we, in these circumstances that don't feel safe. Yeah. Yeah, no, um, coming to Auckland in the first week of October, I will be wearing my mask in the plane, no question. I've sort of thought about it today. I thought, you know, I think, uh, maybe not everyone, Anna, you're probably perfect, but many of us have re have increased our risk somewhat in some places, uh, sensible, sensible risks. Yeah. But I still think that if I was to go into a place that was closed off, lots of people, close quarters, at today or tomorrow, I should say, I probably will still still wear a mask. I think that would be my practice. Yeah. So, and, and, and a plane is one of those places. A plane is definitely one of those places. Yeah. And I think, I think the places that – um, is going to be hardest to be a part of um, with low masking uh, events, you know, like whether that's work events, um, you know, where you're all in a confined space or entertainment. I mean, okay, people have been going to bars for a while now, but, you know, you know, we've, we've had conferences and where masking is required. Are we going to start seeing, you know, hosts of events not put masking, should, you know, please mask if you can because all of, because now it's not a requirement it's not going to get asked is it so i no. think we're going to see all of those things dissolve away which is going to lead to more and more infections rippling rippling around it might not shoot up our case numbers but it's going to ripple around because that's the places that the virus spreads okay so this is the response from dr david welsh you might be interested to see this as well anna so same question to him you know are you going to start are you going to change your behaviors tomorrow uh, his response was uh, i've been easing off in my mask use the last couple of weeks with low numbers but still wearing it in class and in meetings at work so no so no immediate change we'll probably keep it on in shops too especially if they're busy that's sort of what i'm saying in those in those confined spaces dr david welsh says that uh susie wiles as well um i asked her and she says i'm definitely not changing my behavior and i'm going to be watching the covid waste water data to see how the prevalence is changing apologies for those i was putting this together at two minutes to 10 i should have spread those out better but uh so keeping an eye on the wastewater so i guess kind of doing their own numbers to see if the looks like cases are going up officially via wastewater which is probably the best way to look at things now isn't it because people who aren't reporting aren't reporting so that means out of the five people i approached and i did ask michael baker as well but obviously busy man didn't hear back from him uh you so this is the this is the list of people i've been talking to you michael plant plank sorry um susie wiles david welsh all basically saying not going to change mask usage tomorrow from today which I think is telling because as we've said all the way through this, uh, we want to speak to the people at the pointy end, uh, not not being conspiracy theorists about the ninth floor, ninth floor of the beehive, but the people in the labs, I think, uh, have better advice perhaps than the people on the ninth floor are giving out, especially when they say things like it's now safe to go out and do this rather than safer. It might be safer than it was six weeks ago, but it's not necessarily. That, that absolute word certainly changes the vibe of what that feels like. And, and, and using the word certainty, I think, was a giant stretch. Like that summer is going to bring mm. us certainty. Yeah. Because, because no COVID knows, being cancelled. Yeah, because COVID knows to not, um, you know, encroach on our summer now. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we, we, we've looked into the crystal ball and there's going to be certainty. Yeah. And, you know, and we're going to get over our so-called COVID anxiety over summer. I mean, all of those things were just really um, deflating things to hear 
um, for the vulnerable communities who have been battling away in their own self-isolation, trying their best to avoid infection, and now all bets are off, um, you know, in, in a lot of these environments. I mean, in, in, in retaining masks in healthcare settings, you know, yay. I mean, is that not just logic? Mm. So. You know. I was interested, I read, and I know, know you and I Anna, have been talking about the orange situation with masks in schools, but I was really interested to read last week. I got a bit annoyed, actually, because uh, there was principals talking about now that they've brought masks back into schools, all of a sudden, a whole bunch of the kids weren't getting sick. And I was just like, oh, like now that we've decided to bring them back in in the last like two months, it's like all of a sudden we've got a, a roll of 83 to 95% again, not down at 46%, like we keep getting told by Christopher Luxon. I know. It's magic, isn't it? You know, it the, is magic. The, yeah, it's totally magic that masks help this. And and okay, you know, we we do have summer on our side and the warmer weather coming, but we also know that that doesn't actually prevent the waves. You know, all the other countries that have been through summers have had waves. We're just following suit that we're going to pretend that you know that that people uh, that death's not happening and that people aren't getting long COVID, all of those things are going to go on behind the scenes with, with no real reflection on, you know, that the things aren't changing. Cool. Dr. Anna Brooks. Anna, thanks for joining us again. It was uh, nice to get you in for a bit. I felt like your text was more fiery than our conversation. I was, I was, I was, I was, I was, I was waiting for the, for the, for the flame to come out, but that was good as uh, you, you're being professional and more reserved perhaps, but you know, if you want to, if you want to yell at me on the text anytime, you're more than welcome to. Sure. Cool. <laughs> thanks Anna. Awesome. All the best, yeah. mate.